The Call, written by Entropic Society. This story isn't terribly long, and there isn't a ton of details that I can share, but I suppose that is part of the reason I am still struggling with understanding what had happened that night. It was one of those calls that still leaves me confused, and honestly, a bit afraid. I thought being a 27-year-old man that grew up in the woods, I'd have a decent grasp on what lives out there, but I guess I still have no idea. I live in a small town in Tennessee that nestles up against the Smoky Mountains. I have worked as a firefighter for three years, and I have been on my fair share of calls, all of which were unique but also very similar to one another. The station I work at was small. I guess the town supports the station according to the town's population. The town was mainly inhabited by older couples or families that lived there for generations. Needless to say, the station I worked at was basically a skeleton crew. Three of us would work on call and this would rotate due to shifts based on who worked the graveyard. The graveyard was honestly not so bad, since nearly no one ever called in. You basically got paid to stay up and play cards with other firefighters. I remember the night of the call being slightly cold as we were just starting to get into the fall. This time of year was great since football had just started, but more people would be out having bonfires, which would eventually lead to more calls for us to go on. Not that this matters, but I'll add this tidbit about the station I worked at to give you a better understanding why this call had freaked us out so much. Station 19 was supposedly haunted by an old fire chief that had burnt to death on a gruesome call about 30 years ago. Most deaths related to fire are due to smoke inhalation, but not the chief. His suit had somehow gotten some type of flammable liquid on it which cooked him alive. He's able to make it out of the building while on fire, but the flames had burnt him so bad that most of his skin had melted off. The chief would die two days later in the hospital, but that wouldn't be the end of the chief's appearance at the station. It is rumored that you could see the skinless chief before a call where someone in the station would quote unquote die, but there have been accounts when an unaccounted for firefighter could be seen either in the fire engine or on the call itself while dressed in full gear. The chief's name was Sam, so we refer to him and his ghost as Safety Sam, since his appearance would give us a brief warning to be alert. That is, if you believe in that kind of thing. The night I was working on was slow, just like every other graveyard shift I'd ever worked. I was lucky to be working with a good friend of mine, whose name was Jason, who was two years younger than me. He had just gotten back from paternity leave, so it was good to have him back on the station. The other guy on our shift was named Tucker, or Old Tuck as we call him. He was an older guy, and was crazier than a rabbit raccoon, but he was one of the best fire engine operators in the state. He actually knew Chief Sam and worked with him a few times, but, but wasn't there on the night of the incident. However, he was a huge believer in the paranormal, and especially superstition. The night with us three was slow since it was late night and nothing ever good is on television. Tucker normally rested his eyes in the garage near the engine, and Jason and I raided the fridge and watched football highlights. Technically, you weren't supposed to nap while on the graveyard shift, but Tucker was so old and always woke up to the sound of the alarm anyway, so we didn't ever bother him. Jason and I had just switched channels from highlights to Netflix when Tucker bursted in from the garage with a look of terror on his face. We both jumped at Tucker as he screamed, I saw Sam in the garage. We would have taken him more seriously had he had not had bedhead from napping for the last three hours. Um, are you sure it just wasn't a bad dream? Jason joked as he ate a bowl of cereal. Before Tuck could respond, a chilling sound erupted throughout the entire station. The fire alarm was now sounding. We were now on high alert for multiple reasons, but Tuck saying he saw Sam made us more on edge. We got our gear on and rushed over to the fire truck. Old Tuck took the wheel, I took the front, and Jason sat in the back. The radio gave us an address clear on the other side of town. There also was the request for police and medical units. 
we knew that this was now serious. The area started to go up into the mountains, but should still be accessible for the fire truck. It was early into the morning, about four or so. The town was empty, but we still had to blare our alarms as protocol would require, waking just about everyone in a mile radius in the town. On the drive over, I couldn't help but think what Tuck had told us before we went on this call. Did he really see something? Should we be worried? We eventually made it to the street on which the call was on, and it seemed to be out in the middle of the woods. The trees were spaced a good distance apart, but the night covered the woods and this blanket of fog that only the engine's lights can illuminate. We could eventually see up the road a small cabin burning bright, like a beacon. To our dismay, we were the first to the call, and Jason and I jumped out with their gear on while Tuck parked the fire engine. Normally in a suburban setting, we would man the hoses on the truck while the rest of the team checks the building for people. But since we were running a skeleton crew on the graveyard shift, we were down people, so we had to improvise. I ran over to the cabin and began hitting the front door with my axe. It took me a few hits before I realized a thick chain on the front door, which I assumed was there to prevent from anyone from leaving the cabin. I stopped for a moment before I heard a cry from behind me. A younger woman in her nightly attire screamed at me, telling me to stop and to let the cabin burn. Jason quickly ran over to her to get her information from her and to calm her down. While he was helping her, I went back to hitting the door, when the door began to shake violently. I'd made a small hole into the door, roughly the size of a gallon of milk. There must have been someone still inside, or so I thought. That's when Jason screamed from behind me. I turned to see the woman holding a pistol at Jason's head, telling me to let the cabin burn. I stepped away from the door still holding my fire axe, ready to cleave the woman's head into two, when I saw another fireman approach from the darkness. He spoke soft but clear. Let it burn. Initially I thought it to be Tuck, but the voice sounded completely different. The other fireman stood just on the edge of darkness, not letting me get a good look at him. I lowered my axe and told her I'll let it burn as long as she let Jason go. She screamed again and pointed behind me, to which I saw a long, pale arm reaching through the hole in the door that I created. The arm had cuts on it and its flesh was melting. Its hands were skinny and long and its fingers had talons on the end of it. I knew right away despite its appearance that this wasn't a human arm. I didn't think but just reacted and ran over to the door and swung my axe at it. I hit the arm dead on and felt the crack of its bones as the arm almost came off. A screech was then heard that split the night that nearly caused me to jump. The arm then retracted back into the cabin before I could swing again, while its screaming continued. I stepped back to the woman and Jason, which we now all understood why the cabin had to burn. She handed me the pistol I would forgotten she had had and I quickly snatched it from her. I checked the pistol and sure enough. It was empty. She told me while watching the flames that bullets didn't seem to hurt it. Only flames. We sat there and watched as other emergency units arrived. Jason and I made up a story that only the woman was there and that there was nothing left inside. Looking back, I'm glad we got a heads up from our friend from beyond the grave. Wendigo, a terrifying story, no author. It was my friend Caden's birthday party about a month ago, and I must say, it was pretty fun. My three friends, Enrique, Cody, and Ian, and I went to his party at his house. We went there on a Friday and stayed over for the night. We played video games, ate cake, and best of all, drank a ton of soda. This fun ensued until 3 o'clock in the morning, when his dad finally told us to lie down and fall asleep. We did the first thing, but the second thing not so much. We got some sleeping bags out and just talked for another hour or so. We joked around and talked about some stuff, and then the topic of the Wendigo came up. The Wendigo is a cannibal demon of Native American mythology 
that I wrote a short scary story about in my creative writing class in school. I let my friends read the story the day before and they said it was pretty scary, but I figured they were more scared by the picture on the cover page than the actual story. The picture was sure frightening. It showed the portrait of a wendigo, the skull-like head of a deer placed on a human-like bipedal body with long narrow arms and fingers and crouching long legs with hooves like a horse. The body looked like it was rotting away, as if the wendigo itself was a corpse. It had blood dripping from its long, sharp teeth. Enrique loved the fact that the wendigo scared Cody and Caden so much. He basically teased them in the black of night that it was coming to possess them, turning them into cannibalistic spirits. Shut up, they would tell Enrique. Seriously, shut up. What? Are you guys scared? He would taunt them. I thought the entire thing was really funny, as of course there was no such thing as the Wendigo, but I could tell that they were getting even more afraid. Once Caden looked at the window without the blinds over it and thought that the Wendigo would steer him through the window. He was too scared to actually get up and shut the blinds, though, so I did. Enrique continued to tease them. He got out his laptop and googled images of the Wendigo. Then he went on the Wikipedia page for the Wendigo. He read aloud, All cultures in which the Wendigo myth appeared shared the same belief that human beings could turn into Wendigos if they ever resort to cannibalism or, alternatively, become possessed by the demonic spirit of a Wendigo, often in a dream. What's a demonic spirit? Ian asked. Watching the taunting unfold, Enrique googled it. He found out that a demonic spirit is like a ghost, except it can possess your body and have control over all your actions. He also found out that if you say the demon's name out loud, you have summoned it. You have made its duty to possess you. Well, if that's true, Enrique said. Wendigo, Wendigo, Wendigo! Come get me, Wendigo! Enrique, shut up, Cody and Keaton said both of them on the verge of throwing something in his face. I interjected. You guys, the Wendigo is fake. Now shut up and go to sleep. Whatever, I'm tired anyways, Enrique said as he yawned. And we fell asleep. The next morning I woke up and went to the bathroom. Nobody was up yet. I decided I would eat some cake from yesterday for breakfast. I went to the fridge and got some. As soon as I turned around, I let out a frightened screech. Enrique was up in my face. Whoa, you scared me there, I said. No response. He just gave me a face, a chilling face. His eyes were sunken in and he gave me a non-smiling, wide-eyed pale look. I sat down at the table and ate the cake. Soon Ian, Cody, and Caden got up. A few hours later, my mom picked me up and I went home. That night, I went to bed afraid of the Wendigo. I remember what Enrique said, and I became increasingly more and more frightened. Eventually, I gained enough confidence to finally sit up in bed and say, It doesn't exist, so I'm just going to say its name. Wendigo. A few seconds passed. See, Taylor, there's no Wendigo, I told myself. Then I heard a scratching noise at my bedroom door. It started off barely audible, before it became louder and louder. Oh no, what have I done? The scratching noise was so loud that I thought I was going to break down my door, whatever it was. Finally, I got out of my bed and approached the door. As I started walking towards it, the scratching got louder. My hand inches away from the knob was hesitant to open the door. From the time my hand was inches away to when I finally opened the door, felt like an eternity. I twisted the knob slowly and slammed open the door. I didn't see anything. I heard a barking noise. I looked down and saw my bulldog, Fat Chops. Relieved, I let my dog in my room. On Monday, I returned to school. My school is a charter school that has a dress code, and on that particular day, I received a detention for forgetting to wear my belt. The next day I had soccer practice, so I knew that I had to serve it that day. The day went on normally, but at 3 o'clock I had to go to Mrs. Foster's room to serve my detention. 
I was the only one in the room with her. After a few minutes, she told me that she had to go somewhere really quick. Okay, I said. About a minute later, I saw Enrique outside the door and he came in. What's up? I said, glad that he was there. He looked at me with the same pale face he'd given me earlier, with his eyes sunken in and a neutral expression. Are you okay, dude? I said. No response. Hello? He got up and went into the corner of the room and just sat there. Enrique, I said, growing more uneasy. Enrique, I repeated. Enrique, dude, you're starting to scare me. All of a sudden, his face looked up at the ceiling and started to transform into a hideous, pale-skinned, jagged-toothed creature. Afraid, I started slowly moving backwards. He was possessed by the Wendigo. I broke the window in the classroom and ran out of there. Next to the school were some trees that I thought I could hide in. I ran probably for a few hundred feet into the trees. As soon as I got into the foliage, I hid behind a tree trunk that was wider than me. I was afraid to look back at the school, but slowly, I turned my head backwards. I was hesitant to, but I wanted to see if he was still following me. As soon as my eyes were facing the school, I was face to face with the demon. I ran further into the trees. They were covering up the sun, so it got dark. The air was very humid, yet a cool breeze came by. Eventually, I think I lost him. It felt like I'd been running from a demon for hours. Sure enough, I looked at my watch and it was already 7 o'clock. Even though I had lost my pursuer, I still bit my fingernails in terror. Finally, I got out of the forest. The trees led me to a road lit with one streetlight. The road only had a few houses on it. I started walking down the road, looking down. When I raised my head, I saw under the streetlight my bulldog, Fat Chops. I ran to her and started petting her. Who's a good girl? You are. Yes, you are. I said in a baby voice. What are you doing down here, Fat Chops? What are you doing? She started whimpering. I looked behind me, thinking that maybe she was whimpering because something out of my field of vision. I was hesitant to look back, but I slowly turned my head and saw nothing. Oh. That's okay, girl, I reassured her. I started walking down the road as Fat Chops followed. As I started getting further away from the streetlight, it got darker and darker. Eventually, I saw another streetlight. Still, I kept on walking and saw another streetlight further down. Finally, I passed five of these other posts and underneath the light looked at the time of my watch. It was nine o'clock. I'd been out on the road for two hours. I started to run in a hurry and looked behind me. Fat Chops was nowhere to be seen, so I started running back, looking for my dog. Fat Chops, I would call out. Fat Chops! As I went under a streetlight, I looked at my watch. It was 12 o'clock. That seemingly short period of time was three hours. I went up to the light pole and saw a missing poster for me. Past the streetlights, I looked at the house in front of it. It looked exactly like the houses I saw before. Dazed, I started running as fast as I could. I got to the next streetlight, checked the time, and saw that it was 1 in the morning, even though it felt like 5 seconds had passed. I ran further, and eventually the streetlights came closer and closer. I looked down on my watch. Each minute passed in a fraction of a second. Finally, my clock read, 3 a.m., and stopped. It was the devil's hour. Suddenly, I tripped on something and fell in the street. As I regained my footing, I looked down the street and saw a pair of very tall legs. As I looked up, I saw them connect to a skeleton-like body with long arms and slender fingers. On top of the body was a skull-like head of a deer. Come here, it said in a raspy, devilish voice. My body froze, and it started coming closer and closer. I was right in my face, but then I regained my muscle movement. I fell back to the pavement, closed my eyes, and just hope I would make it out alive. As soon as I opened them, it was morning, and I walked back to my house. My mom was sure happy to see me. Taylor, we missed you so much! Where have you been? She said as I walked in. 
It was hard to tell her the story about what had happened, so I didn't. Do you know where Enrique is? He's been missing too, she said. I nodded simply sideways. They never did find Enrique. Nobody ever knows what had happened to him, but I do. The Wendigo hasn't quit either. At night, I constantly hear a whispering in my ear. My window gets knocked on. I have nightmares about it. But before it can possess me in my dreams, I always wake up. I always fight for my body. Well, I'm not going to fight for it tonight. I'm done dealing with the Wendigo. The Whisper of the Woods Written by Damiana Rose Hello, my name is Lou and I'm here for, well, telling a story. Believe me or not, laugh or cry, I don't care anymore. I wish I could do something, turn back time, and undo the stupid things that led to it. I wish I could tell someone, but... That would come at a price of being admitted to some place where I can heal and regain my sanity. I even accepted that the police cannot do a thing. All I want, all I need, is to get rid of this heavy weight on my heart. To dump all my sorrows and let it get somewhere else. Take it. Take all of it, I beg you. Is it survivor's guilt? I guess. And even though it wasn't even my idea... Had I used my big hand for just a second, I could have saved us. Them. Oh my gosh. What am I even saying? Why, the idea is not really mine. It was my friend's, but I could not begin here. I should first tell a story that's not mine. I should begin with the murder of Aspen Brooke. Aspen Brooke was an 18-year-old high school boy whose dead body was found a few months ago. Weirdly enough, it was not really in any newspapers except the one of his hometown. A writer of our local newspaper has family there, it seems, and that must be the reason it was in ours as well. When I asked my grandparents about it, they did not even know the name of Aspen Brooke, especially not the town he lived in. I'd rather not share its name online since I'm sure some stupid morons might try to get there, and I cannot take responsibility for that. Especially, I do not want my mind already so full of guilt to once more take the blame for such a misfortune. No, don't even try asking me. Well, back to Aspen. He was murdered in a forest near his school, it seems. It was not mentioned what school he goes to, but I doubt anyone would be willing to go to some strange school in the woods at night, alone. He had his chessboard in pieces with him. It was speculated that he might have lost or forgotten them there and tried to retrieve them, and thus broke into the school. Actually, that would make sense. Would there be signs of forceful entry into the school? However, don't mind that now. No, don't. Aspen was found some morning after having just disappeared from life for a long time, it seems. His family didn't find him. No one did but the forest and some unfortunate soul. Just one Monday morning, he lay there between the leaves. His hands folded into each other. His skin was not yet fouling. There were no maggots. Nothing. It was just he was dead. For a long time, as a puzzled policeman claimed, he would have looked like a dead angel had his fancy clothes not been ripped open at multiple places, his hair not been so white and faded of color, his skin not so bloody, and his right eye. His right eye was missing. There was no gaping hole. No, a bloody, crusty hole. F. I've seen the photo, and it was horrible. My mom asked me to burn it. She had horrible nightmares afterwards. Little does she know that I kept it, just because it was so weird. I couldn't sleep that night either, nor because the photo were showing Aspen, but because if the killer continued running around, it could be me, my family, or my friends next. Dead, with one eye missing. 
looking so pitiful. I could not sleep any longer before I knew more, so I started doing my research. At first, it was difficult. I asked random people in the town, but no one seemed to know him. A few people knew him as the winner of the chess tournaments, or the boy who disappeared and was found dead days later. An old lady, however, told me that he had been a sweet boy. His family was incredibly poor, and he tried to make money by winning in chess tournaments. It seemed that he was very intelligent, sly, cunning, especially calculating. She told me that even if nothing of his body remains, his merits will remain printed in the newspaper. I asked her to show me, and she willingly gave me one, but only for a quick look. There he was, but this time with both eyes his androgynous face full of delight, his pale blonde hair as if he had just moved quickly, his gray eyes full of surprising warmth. He looked like a real angel this time. The paper bore the headline, Another Spectacular Win by Aspen Brook. Yet the article did not contain much information about him, only his age, and that he always won. Aspen, the lady said, had not always had it easy. I heard he was bullied really bad for his somewhat feminine looks, for his unusual name, for his social status, and, weirdly enough, for his intellect. He, on the other hand, accepted it all and refused to move somewhere else so he could continue these tournaments and support his mother with money. Family. Treasure it while it still remains. And that was all. She politely refused to give me any of her treasured newspapers. She seemed to have thought him a hero, or maybe she was just mourning him for the sweet boy of the neighborhood. Not only once or twice, I wondered if he had done some part-time work for her that both could profit from. Money from running errands? Cleaning her kitchen? While he did not let people push him around, Aspen sure let fate push him around and knelt down for every dollar. I'm almost feeling sorry for the lad. No, I really am. Just some part of me tells me that it's all a waste. I have always wondered what was the matter with these tournaments, until I found it in the newspapers. The different schools in the surrounding towns played host, and only people living in these towns could participate to win money for their schools. They're a good cause of choice, and lastly, themselves. It was not easy finding someone who could give me the papers. And in most, Aspen is only mentioned briefly as a winner. His school is never mentioned, but to me, it does not make a difference. But what else I got from them is that he always has a way of, well, just being that makes him stand out. The usual shy and sad-looking boy is unnaturally fierce and sassy when winning. While his family socially stands lower than most, his sudden self-confidence can make him seem like an ancient nobility. And when his features are distorted hotly, the girls are all over him. He does not care about any luxuries, and has a shabby school bag while wearing a fancy and elegant clothing to tournaments and on some occasions to school. His chessboard is new, but his chess pieces are a family heirloom. He sold the old board, which was an old heirloom as well, and when an interviewer asked him if he'd sell the pieces too, he just replied, No. No, not the pieces. Why, you see, the chessboard is merely a board, yet the pieces are family. This pawn I can remember my grandfather using it alone to win against me when I was just a kid. I can remember his gleeful ancient face, that one time smiling kindly and telling me that I really did do a good job, but I should keep my eyes everywhere. The next time he drew a few pairs of eyes on a paper, cut them out and placed them all over the pieces, in danger every time such was the case, and told me why that was and what I could do. You see, selling my pieces is like selling my late grandfather. While it is not only illegal, it also is something only someone out of their mind could do without the guilt tearing their heart out. Family, while it remains, should always be treasured, regardless of what is left behind. He was a sentimental boy, Aspen. He had a good heart, a sharper mind, and good looks. But what remained of him was fright in others. 
The school had to close a few days after the corpse was discovered because the students and teachers could not bring themselves to enter. They felt horrible in there. They got nightmares and the soft whispers of the wind never seemed to stop and follow them even into the bathroom cabins, whispering them the stories of a dead man. The dead man who once was nothing but a loser among them, who no one bothered to save from his misery, except if he smirked when he won a round of chess. It would be summer vacation soon enough, and all examinations were over, so the headmaster and probably a lot of important people in the background decided to let them all go. That, too, was only in two local newspapers. Now, that was Aspen's side of the story. But now it's time for mine, and while I don't want to be reminded of anyone of it, much less by myself, I know I need to let it out of my soul, my heart, my mind, and my life. My name is Lewis, and I'm called Lou by most people, and I'm a 16-year-old teenager. My five best friends and I wanted to spend summer vacation together, one friend proposing going camping in a specific forest because he heard it was haunted. None of us knew any of that, and none of us cared. We did not even know if what we were doing was legal. Still, we packed our tents, sleeping bags, food, a flashlight, a bunch of matches, the normal things, but also a Ouija board. Yesterday around 1pm, we idiots made it to the train station, to the town and wandered off into the woods, to never be seen again? Well, I think I should stop telling everything in such a confusing way. No, this will be a story. The story of stupid me and my stupid ways. At about 1.30pm we entered the forest. It was a warm day, and the sky was deprived of clouds, yet under the high trees the chilly darkness was such a contrast that it was overwhelming. We entered through a street that led from a side street to a bunch of old uninhabited houses covered in cobwebs, plants, and fungi. At first we even wanted to investigate those, for Terry had gotten us a Ouija board. Terry, the boy who also urged us to go camping here. I should have thought it weird that he told us so much about ghosts in the forest, but refused to search for ghosts in a few abandoned houses. Never mind that now. Instead, we went to the forest. The moment we entered through a small opening between the bushes and even some overgrown hedges of the houses around, the whole atmosphere changed. I felt like my body had been drenched deep into my bones with the most icy water. The air was clean and fresh, but also felt unnaturally cold. The ancient trees threw giant shadows onto the ground, so covered in dead leaves that we could barely make out the small path that we took to not get lost in the vast space. The forest was gigantic, overwhelming, and it was slightly unwelcoming, but I believe we all told ourselves that it was only in our minds, since we went on. The further we went, the colder the air got, the higher the trees, the longer the shadows, the more silent the forest. At first there were a few birds singing and at one point Justin had sworn to us all that he just saw a fox, but suddenly it was like everything had faded. Sound, color, smell, even warmth, everything seemed dead and lifeless. The only sign that I had that not becoming suddenly deaf was the sound of footsteps on the leaves. Leaves that so spitefully covered every inch now as if to tell us something. To leave. That we'd never return. That we lay among them for brainless kids to walk on us, crush us while we crunch and crinkle upon contact with their shoes. The only other thing that still remained was the sound of wind, the rustling of leaves the whispers of trees. The further we went, the stronger it grew. At one point, Mike felt so uncomfortable, he asked for a small break so he could sit down and eat, as he claimed he wanted, but we had a huge lunch at the train station, and I think I could read in his face the fear of continuing going on. There was a clearing, 
right in front of us, and John said he'd just want to go sit over there and put up camp. Terry, however, was not pleased with this. He told us that this part of the forest is not where the ghosts dwell, yet Justin told him to go search his stupid ghost on his own then. In the end, he was okay with it. We decided to go look for wood, and Mike and Justin volunteered for this. I put up the tents, John got the food and matches, waiting eagerly, and Terry bored us all with his ghost. After about 20 minutes, Justin returned with one or two slightly large pieces of wood. John asked him politely if this is all he could find, but Justin snapped at him. We were all baffled that usually the cheerful and polite Justin, who had blabbered happily about the fox he had seen only a few hours ago, had become so exaggeratedly aggressive. This bad mood persisted the whole evening. We had waited for maybe 30 more minutes until we decided that Mike must have gotten lost. I said that we must search for him, but Paul said that it was too dangerous to stroll around here alone, and that we should wait. In the end, we cleared a patch of soil in the area around it, and burned the bit of wood we had and some other of our wood properties, such as tissue. Sitting around the minuscule campfire and eating our sausages, we dreaded that Mike might not ever return. Terry, of course, told us that the ghost had gotten him. Justin said we should ask the stupid ghost then what he did to our friend. Ten minutes later, we sat around the Ouija board and asked the ghost questions. It, however, replied in French. Only Paul could speak French since he had a lot of family in Quebec. We still had not asked what happened to Mike. We were too busy asking moronic questions such as, What color were the panties you dined in? and eagerly awaiting its reply. Terry kept telling us to be careful, since the spirit already made fun of us by replying in French, since it obviously understood English quite well. It replied to every question, and honestly, I guess we were all scared to ask what had happened to our dear Mike. However, Terry kept telling us to, and when an annoyed John finally gave in, the spirit just said something that Paul translated as, I do not know what to say. A mad look appeared on John's moonlit face, making his huge eyes appear even bigger and madder than usual, as he said in an exaggerated dramatic voice, Why don't you show us then? Terry had already opened his mouth as to tell him off for his stupidity when he suddenly gagged, yelping and collapsing on the floor. All eyes were on Terry as he began to twitch. I dared a quick glance at the others to see their shock on their faces. Paul still had his hand on his mouth, the cracker already melting into a puddle of spit and a soaked something that trickled down his chin. Dude, you okay? John asked and knelt down beside Terry with a look of terror all across his even more mad looking face. His eyeballs appeared to desire nothing more than to leave the eye sockets. It all happened so fast. Suddenly there was a fist around his neck and we heard a snap. The sound was disgusting and seemed to resonate in the whole forest. We all just sat there, all but Paul. Terry, however, seemed not to notice. As if that had been the signal, Justin got up and roared in anger. Terry still looked perfectly unbothered, as if such things happened every day, yet drew near. Justin ran away and Terry ran behind him. Yet suddenly, Paul hit him hard in the face and made him fall onto the cold ground. Terry got up and was now running away. Paul caught up with him soon, hate etched onto every corner of his pointy and serious face. There was a flash of red as Paul grabbed onto Jerry's shoulders and rammed his foot into Terry's nose. Blood splattered everywhere, and Terry's nose looked weirdly disfigured, as if he had just woken from a nightmare. He yelped again and moved a hand to examine his nose. It seemed to have happened in slow motion. Terry fell down into the ground again, looking unapologetically into Paul's unusually cool blue eyes that seemed to emit an unusual warmth now, as if they had understood something, as if they had known. Before Paul could extend his arm to help Terry up, before he could crack an apologetic smile, however, two wolves appeared out of nowhere. A split second passed and the only thing I saw was even more blood. The wolves hungrily dug into the raw meat. Now that I was thinking about it, 
I'm not even sure that's how wolves are supposed to behave when they're hungry. My body seemed to freeze and I ran for my life, Justin at my heels screaming at me for being a coward, for not helping anyone. Justin. He was the only one left. The only one of my beloved friends, the people I had shared so many memories with. Yet while his body, large and soft, clearly belonged to Justin, I knew that this was in fact, not him. I sought shelter in the abandoned large building I found. There was no graffiti. The windows were not broken anywhere. The only door was wide open as to tell me to come in. I should have seen the bad omen back when I ran in there for my life, and I couldn't think straight. To be honest, I couldn't think at all. I tried to run up the stairs as quickly yet silently as possible. Found a somewhat hidden room with the window. I crawled on all four for my legs could not have kept me up in the direction of the cupboard. It was dark, and the only light source was the bit of moonlight that managed to break through the carpet of tall treetops. My shivering hand could barely open the cupboard, and just when I had crawled into the cramped space behind a moldy high stack of old books, I already heard Justin yelling, Where are you? Hiding like you always do? Come on and face me like a man. I gave you a chance. Now get here, in ten, nine, eight. He counted down. Fine, he screamed as he reached zero. I'll kill you, you coward, you crybaby. The list of insults continued as I heard Justin burst into the room after room, sometimes accompanied by a mad cackle. I knew I was doomed then, or at least I thought so. Breathing what I thought were my last breaths of life, Alone in a moldy cupboard between moldy bugs and spiders crawling all over my hair, my hands, and my head. Before my eyes, I saw my life going backwards. I saw my friend sitting on a dead tree in the clearing. Us on the train. My mom. The newspaper. The old lady. Suddenly it all made sense. At least a bit. Because I remember where this was. Why the school was closed. And who was found here. But that did not make things better. So deep in thought, I almost entirely forgot about the fact that I sat in a moldy cupboard, and even more so, the reason why I sat in it. I exclaimed, HA! But as I exclaimed, I sat up and hit my head and wailed in pain and confusion. Justin bursted into the room, looking like a hungry animal that had at last cornered its prey. I, as the idiot I am, had forgotten to close the cupboard again. Our eyes met, and I'll never forget the senseless expression of his usually cheerful brown eyes that now resembled a muddy gray-brown than their usual friendly glowing chocolate hue. He looked almost dead. His skin looked slightly gray, like all life had evaporated, and the only reason he did not lay motionless on the floor was the desire to hunt, hurt, and murder. I seemed to float up high on a cloud of dread and panic. My soul seemed to leave my body as my eyes might have spelt the deepest regret for anything and everything. Then he collapsed on the floor. I did not approach him. I was ready to just jump out the window, but I couldn't move a muscle. I found my voice and I did not really know why, but I said, Aspen? Then after a while I said, Sorry. The time moved forward slower than an old snail, but I'm sure that several minutes passed before I started crying and apologizing. Asking for forgiveness. For what? I don't know. I don't freaking know. I just wanted to get out of there. Preferably alive, but even death seemed fine back then as long as I'd be away. I suddenly heard a gasp and someone trying to breathe as fast and deeply as possible at the same time. Justin got up, looking blue everywhere. He just breathed and stared at me, but that was fine, for I know it had not been him. His eyes regained the soft, misleading, weak expression, but not their gleeful glow. His face was stern, and that was even worse than him running after me and calling me names, threatening to kill me. Aspen, he said. Aspen, I replied. He took an even deeper breath, but breathed it out. Then he took a very unelegant gulp of air and breathed out again, as if he wanted to ask but 
Neither had the spare oxygen nor courage. Finally, he asked, Who is that? I heard you telling him sorry. I held my face as if that would help me keep my thoughts aligned and noticed that it was covering my tears. I quickly and slightly embarrassed wiped my face on my sleeve and considered my wording for a few seconds. Finally, I answered, The one behind it all. I don't know what he wants. He's just the boy who was found here a few months ago. The corpse without any signs of death. No fouling. No maggots. Nothing. My voice began to crack. He can't be dead. No. And I've, I've got this feeling he's playing human chess with us all. And I'm the enemy team. And you guys are... were... his. Once the words were out of my mouth, I was about to find a lame excuse for what I said when... Justin seemed to snap and excitedly yelled, Yes! Yes, I think so too! Oh, Lou! Oh, Lou! He began to cry. I tried to think of words of comfort when the idea quickly formed in my mind, and before I knew what I said, I did in fact say it. Let's burn him. He's dead yet alive. He... He ate Terry. And Paul. I'm sure of it. He's not a spirit. He must be a... A Wendigo. Justin nodded. Now it was his turn to wipe his face. How funny. First you ridicule me, then you chase me. Then I get my revenge. Then you say sorry, I mean, I was about to let you go. Said a whispery, yet slightly harsh, a cool yet somewhat pleased voice. Right beside me. Right from the next window. I stared to where before only a dusty window had been. He looked terrible. His voice continued in a resentful, somewhat uncontrolled manner, as his eye bore deep into mine. And now you compare me to that cannibal spirit and want to kill me? He stepped into the patch of moonlight, which illuminated not only his body, still looking the same as an old photograph, but also two brownish red antlers. I thought he looked quite a lot like a wendigo. A sad smile, an unexpected sign of amusement on his before so resentfully a bitter face appeared, as if he had read my thoughts. Oh, Lou, he said. Those are only in my head for a reason. I too do not very much understand. But I can assure you, I am no Wendigo. No. I am the forest. The forest made me his. No. It made me its king. Animals do my bidding. The plants grow how I want them to. The wind blows when I want it. And that is, as you already saw, surely not all. But I shall not show off to scum like you. I'm not as disgustingly self-absorbed as you rich kids. And well now, these antlers, don't they look like a crown? A majestic headdress. You see, you see, the coronation is over. The king stands before you, and I shall grant a peasant like you a wish. For a charge, of course. It's not only you rich kids who have power. His eyes rested on Justin for a while. You have money, but money won't help you controlling your temper, or saving you from wolves. For the second time, his mouth twitched upwards, but now it was a gruesome grimace, apparently flaunting a mouth full of sharp teeth growing and rose like a shark. Not only you rich kids can descend from your high position and be benevolent, no. The smile got even wider. Fire, you say? He stepped even more forward and paused. I could count his freckles, one on the eyelid of his missing eye, one on the same side below his lip, and one under his remaining eye. He was even born to look incredibly distinguishable, in such a fate in a world where trendy uniformity was a duty must have been rough. Even though he killed my friends, I could not help but feel a sudden rush of pity and affection, which however evaporated quickly as Aspen drew nearer and nearer. I now saw the five or so cans of gasoline in his hands, the hands that ended in claws. One can was almost empty, the others were full. He resumed his sad smile, but his voice was haughty and fierce. The atmosphere was so sinister that I could not move, even had I wanted to. Yet Aspen whispered softly, Dear, perhaps you'll stop shivering so violently. 
Nothing else could warm you. They even took away the carpet. I liked the carpet. And then now it's but an ugly building, full of ugly memories. And all I want is to remove the ugliness from here. You too. You're an ugly memory also. But soon you'll be but a memory, since ashes don't look pleasant, nor unpleasant. No, Justin retorted. You can't. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do. You're at my mercy. And with that, Aspen emptied the bottles near the door, the desks, and the chairs. And with some difficulty, he extracted a box of matches from his pocket. The same box of matches I had brought up here. I knew it. It was going to be my fault, at least to me. A split second later, I felt like my body was boiled alive. I instinctively ran for the window, as Justin, still immobilized, began to yell for me. I half expected him to tell me just to leave him there, but for the most part it was nothing but a frantic hope. He screamed at me to take him with me, but I had already jumped from the window of the second story, my hand seeking support on a fallen tree branch that, now looking back, was too conveniently placed there. As my hand slipped, I fell down and landed on a huge stack of leaves. Without wounds or broken bones, while well, just behind me Justin cried for the last time in his life. Out of horror and immeasurable pain, I am dreading it, disappointed in me. I got up, but I didn't run. I merely looked behind me. There stood Aspen, a tall and thin, illuminated figure amidst the flames. Flames that did not even touch his seemingly real body. Flames that still devoured every quarter of the school building, with multi books and, and Justin. Now I think I understood what happened there. He's not a ghost, but a living being. He's too attached to this world. His body too resentful and bitter to let go. He wanted me, but I do not know what for. The school building was made out of stone walls on the outside, and only the inside and roof were not fireproof. Yet I ran for my life. Aspen would have killed me had he wanted to, but he didn't. There was no rational reason for me to run, but my dread and grief made me want to release the pressure on my whole body, and to leave this forest, to never come back. I don't really remember much after, you see. I think I told my mother that something horrible happened, but there are so many large gaps in my memories and only unidentifiable snippets of this and that. But now I'm quite safe, at home in front of my computer and I'm waiting for Mike. I thought him dead, but today he messaged me. He wants to talk it over once and for all, finish the chapter, and never go near it again. I am so happy that he too escaped and that Aspen did not harm him. He's coming here at noon. I spent most of my time waiting and typing this out. I don't think I can tell him the truth so bluntly. Actually, I didn't even spend much time typing this out while waiting. I even created an image. I originally planned to ask him if he'd saw someone like this, but I also think I couldn't attach it here. It's almost noon. Just one minute left. My heart is beating like crazy, and I still think I can hear the wind, just like yesterday. I am very paranoid, you know. Just ten more seconds now.